Now, we're on page four of the manual. Uh, we're going to look at these. And I want you to start doing this on a regular basis. This is something that needs to be done every, uh, well, honestly, in every area. Um, whenever you, when you go to a country that is a new country to you and they have, there's, there's uh, cultural differences, even different laws, different ways of doing things, um, you have to consciously look at well, how can I say this? You have to consciously be aware of those situations all the time, right? Uh, you know, simple illustration. Uh, whenever I go to Australia or someplace like that, the first level that I have to be aware of is everything's on the opposite side of the road. You, know, you have to drive on the opposite side of the road. So you have to be uh, conscious of it. And even if you're driving and going somewhere, uh, even if you're talking with someone in the car with you, you have to be talking with them or whatever, but you also have to be conscious of, okay, when I turn this corner, I have to go, you know, it's a, it's a short turn, not a long, you know what I'm saying? It's just a different turn. And so it's the same way whenever you become a Christian is that you're in a different culture and you have to think differently and you have to train yourself to think differently. And so the first aspect of this is, as we've been mentioning a lot here lately, uh, you know, point A was, on, on the other page, was that we must have dominion in every area of our own life. Point B is everything must be viewed through the eyes of the new man or the new creation. So you, have to, you can't think about things the way you used to think about things before you were saved. Or you know, maybe you've been saved a long time, but maybe... Uh, you've just been a nominal Christian or a normal Christian and you kind of just went along with things rather than actually moving into the Bible and doing what it says. When you move into the Bible and you start to find out what happened at the new birth, you realize everything changed. And if you haven't changed everything, then you're not keeping up with where the Bible says you are now. right? And you're still trying to live by the old uh, rules, you might say. And so everything has to be viewed through the eyes of the new man or the new creation. So you have to start thinking in terms of how does this, how does, how does this apply to the new creation or how does the new creation apply to this situation? So we must remember that everything we believe and teach must be viewed through at least three filters. The first filter is the filter of the new man or the new creation, as in contrast to viewing everything through the old man or the Adamic nature. The mind of the new man is the mind of Christ. The mind of the old man is the mind of Satan. It's that simple. There is no in-between. If there were an in-between, then Jesus would not have had to die for us. right? Because you could have just made things right and you wouldn't have to worry about it. You know, you could just be right. right? And this new man mind, the mind of Christ, is effective in us to the degree that we have our mind renewed to the Word of God. You got that? So, the, so the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, it says that <clears throat> now we have the mind of Christ. But even though we have the mind of Christ, it's only effective or useful to us to the degree that our mind is renewed to function with it and work with it. You got that? So it's important. Now, this is not... Um, how can I say it? Okay. It's not hard, but it takes consistency. So in other words, when I say it's not hard, what I mean is it can be done. And now in the beginning, it may seem harder just because you're going you know, totally against the flow. It's like when you first start exercising, those first few uh, workouts, oh, they're awful. Why? Because you're doing something totally different and your body is, is screaming at you of saying, we don't like this. We haven't done this before. This is not the way we're supposed to feel, <laughs> right? And so your body's screaming at you. But once your body starts to adapt to it and it starts to say, okay, this is the way we're going to do things from now on, then it stops screaming qu quite as loud. And you actually have to go harder and further to get the same results. Right? And so we have to realize it's exactly the same way with renewing the mind and with operating as a Christian, that in the beginning, 
Yeah, your mind is going to be screaming at you saying, I don't want to confess the Word of God. I don't want to stand around and just say scriptures. I don't want to spend time listening to stuff. I'd rather go sit down and, you know, watch, watch my shows. You know, I, I don't want to. Well, uh, what do you mean I can't do that anymore? What do you mean? Why? Because those things are not helping you renew your mind. They're helping to unrenew your mind. So you mean I got to cut that off? I don't want to cut that off. I enjoy that. I, I, I like the people in the show. You see? And you and you, it's amazing. You'll develop people. It's faster for people to develop relationships with people in television shows than it is people they've known for 10 years because of the how people get into it. You know, when you watch something, your mind cannot tell if you're watching it or if you've done it. That's a fact. OK, whenever you watch something and you watch somebody else do it, your mind doesn't know somebody else has done it. As far as it's concerned, you're doing it. Think about that. Right. That's now see, science knows this. Jesus said, oh, yeah, uh, you've heard it said that if you do this, then you're guilty of this. But I say unto you, if you even look upon a woman to lust after, you've already done it. Why? Because now it's already played out the movie in your mind or whatever else it is. And it can be that way in anything. Right. Why? Because once you've thought about it, your mind doesn't know you hadn't done it. <laughs> Think about that. When I used to sit and took all those uh, old videos I had of uh, A. Allen, Jack Coe, and William Branham. I'd sit and watch them, and, you know, I'd zip through a lot of the preaching because it wasn't always that accurate. It was, it was good, but uh, I'd, I'd try to get forward to the healing service, and I'd watch them take people out of wheelchairs and pull them up out of wheelchairs and, and take people off of stretchers and take canes away from people and crutches and watch them get healed, and I watched it, and I watched it, and I watched it. And then... One day I finally just got up and said, you know what? If they can do that, I can do that. And why? Because in my mind, as I was watching that, every time I watched them do it, I was doing it. And I'd sit there and tell God, God, I want that. And so finally I started doing it. And so you, your, your brain works that way. Now, so everything uh, has to be gone through that filter. The more our minds are renewed, the less we have to stop and check what we are believing. Understand that? So all of this is geared toward make it easier in your life. And it's not going to be easier in the beginning, but it's going to be easier as you move along. Right. And then it'll be right. And then you'll have certain guideposts that, you know, this is true and that's true. And if that doesn't line up, then that can't be true. So if A and B is true and C doesn't line up with A and B, then, you know, C isn't true. Right. And you don't have to stop and check yourself in that sense. And that's always good to be aware and to look at things, obviously. But I'm saying it's not where you're constantly having to, oh, is this right? Is that right? Is it? No. Y you will get a flow of things. And as long as you are truly born again and expecting the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you into all truth, he'll lead and guide you into truth and not falsehood. Right. And so the, one of the big problems most Christians have is they're constantly second guessing themselves. Well, the reason you second guess yourself is because you make decisions too quick. If you don't make decisions quite as fast then you won't have to second guess yourself. If you make sure you got all the information you need and then you can move forward with it and you make the right decision and then you have a history of making the right decision, then you don't always have to second guess yourself because you, you went through the process that it takes to get the right answer. Amen? But in the world today, what's everything? Everything's now. You know? and people don't walk in and say, hey, I'll need an answer on this uh, next week. No, it's right then. We had a guy, we talked with a guy on television. Uh, we were talking about going on to a particular television uh, station or unit, I guess I'd say. And the guy came in, talked with us. We talked about it and talked about times and prices and all this kind of stuff. Started looking at it and said, okay, let me, let me think about it, pray about it a little bit. Let me see what we need to do. And that was on one day. Then the next day, not. But the next day after that, uh, he called back and lo and behold, um, well, this, this other particular channel is going out, so all the people here are trying to get that time. So uh, if you want those time slots we talked about, I, I need to know something right now. And my daughter said, he need to know right now. And I said, well, then tell him no. And she said, why? I said, because this, okay, first off, I don't know this guy. Uh, but it sure sounded like a, a certain, yeah, like an old car dealer trick. You know? Well, I got 15 other people looking at this car, so if you're going to do it, you better put, put something down there quick. I'm like, we don't need it. Tell them to go ahead and sell it to somebody else. And so, why? Because I'm not going to be pushed into anything. Right? I'll take my time, find out. God knows. He knows how I move. 
And so he's got that right spot for me when I get there. Amen. I don't have to hurry and rush anything. He that believeth shall not make haste, the Bible says. Right? And so I just keep walking and however it'll work out, it'll work out in our favor. Why? Because we follow God. Amen? So um, I, don't, I don't respond well to manipulation or bullying. That doesn't work good with me. Right? Uh, we do what we do. I don't, I don't care if you're, you know, high or low. Uh, if you walk right, I'll walk with you. Right? And I don't care if everybody else is against you. If, if you walk right with God, I'll walk with you. Amen? Now, on the other hand, if you're going to go whichever the way the wind blows because it's best for you, yeah, move along. I ain't got time for that. Amen? We, we're, we work with relationship. Amen? So, notice he says here, point C. Everything must be viewed through the filter of the kingdom. Now, I'm going to give you a scripture. Probably have to go back to point B there. But in Galatians 6.15, it says that in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Right? So everything has to be seen through the eyes of the new man, this new creation. So in Christ Jesus, do you get that? Now, when he says circumcision and uncircumcision, he is referring to keeping the law. And he said, whether you keep the law, whether you don't keep the law, it doesn't avail anything. Either way, he says, but that you are a new creation. You get that? If you're a new creation, guess what? And th this is the amazing thing. I don't know why people don't get this. It's the simplest thing in the world. If you're a new creation, he has written his laws in your heart. Yeah. Right? So you will keep the law, yeah. but not the ritual law. But you'll keep, you'll keep it the way Jesus kept it. Right? And all the Pharisees said, oh, you're violating the law. No, we're just violating your traditions. Because how you think it is isn't how it is. Right? And so he writes his laws on your heart. And then you do them naturally, and they're not grievous. They're not hard to, to do. Why? Because they're part of you. It's part of your nature now. So <clears throat> what counts is not what you do or what you don't do. What counts is that you're a new creation. When you're a new creation, you will do what's right. right? Uh, maybe later today I'll get a chance to ask you about three or four questions that uh, I believe are going to be uh, very essential uh, in, in some understandings of some things even in the near future, maybe even today. We'll, we'll see where we go. But it's just questions about Jesus and certain things about it. So we'll talk about that later on today. Now, <clears throat> look at, um, yeah, the more our minds are renewed to the mind of Christ, to this new creation, the less that we have to stop and wonder about things and the faster you'll be able to move through just making the right decisions because you've already got the basis of right decisions behind you. Now, point C, everything has to be viewed through the filter of the kingdom, as we said. Now, after we have adapted to viewing everything through the eyes of the new man, we must begin to verify that the way we see things are the way things are viewed according to the kingdom of God. Right? Now, what that means is everything you're doing, you have to stop and say, okay, this is where I'm moving. I'm a new creation. So I have to think according to the laws of the kingdom, you might say, uh, which are principles by which we operate. But then we also have to look and say, okay, in the kingdom, is this mindset that I have, is this attitude I have, is this action I'm doing, is this in keeping with the laws of the kingdom? Is this how the kingdom, you know, is my attitude toward this topic the attitude that the kingdom has? You, you understand what I mean by that when I say the attitude the kingdom has? I'm saying, is it the same attitude? Uh, is, is the way you're looking at something the same way God would look at it, the same way it would be seen in the kingdom. Jesus was very uh, pointed in how he approached things. And he said, listen, the kingdom of heaven is like this. You've heard it said this, but I say unto you this. In other words, you've heard it. It was written. You know, it was written down. You've heard it said. You, these are some ideas. He said, you've heard this, you know, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you. Right? And so he would always change it. What was he saying? He was saying, listen, in the kingdom, and, and then he also gave us the uh, kingdom parables. And he said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. And he gave us all of these different parables to show us what the kingdom of heaven was like. And he said, listen, if you want to save your life, you got to lose it. Because if you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, then I will give you my life. 
Well, see, that's, to, that's the opposite of the way the world thinks. You know? Oh, if you want to be exalted, here's how you do it. Humble yourself. Well, the world looks at that and says, well, if I humble myself, how am I going to get exalted? Because if I humble myself, I'm kind of putting myself down and somebody else is going to get the job position. So I, I, I need to exalt myself. I need to let, let them know how good I am at this. And Jesus said, no, no, no. He said, listen, if you do that, you might get into a position that God doesn't want you. You may, you may talk yourself into a position God didn't want you there. God has a better position for you over here. But if you take that job, you won't take this job. And he says, no, if you humble yourself. Now listen, humbling yourself doesn't mean putting yourself down. Humbling yourself means to say and think about you the way God says and thinks about you. Right? It doesn't mean putting yourself down. Well, you know, I'm going to humble myself, so, you know, I'm just a dirty dog. I'm just, I'm just scum of the earth. I just don't matter. You know that? No. That's not what God said. God said you do matter. Why? Because you carry his kingdom. So you do matter. You understand? And he said, but if you humble yourself, then God will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, then that just leaves one other job for God, and that's to humble you. And you don't want God humbling you. Right? You want to do it yourself. Why? Because you won't humble yourself as much as God will humble you. Right? You, you, you take it by degrees. And so the whole point is that the kingdom, and this is the point I was trying to get to, is that the kingdom itself has different attitudes toward things. Right? The, the, the world says, oh, you should gather and gather, and you don't give out, you don't help anybody else, you get what you can, and you build it all up, because whatever you can gather, that's what you're going to have, and the kingdom of heaven is exactly the opposite. The kingdom of heaven says, oh, no, you don't build up treasure here, you build up treasure in heaven. How do you build up treasure in heaven? By sowing into people's lives, by feeding people, by clothing people, by doing what needs to be done, whatever needs to be done to help people, that's what you do, and you will have treasure in heaven. See, it's exactly the opposite. So the, the attitudes of the kingdom are exactly the opposite. That's why this whole thing about, you know, I've had so many people come and try to tell me, well, you know, the prophecies that John Lake gave, that could have been about me. Well, then run with it. You believe that? Take off. Go do it. Wonderful. You know, see how it works out for you. You know, believe me, the, the, the fact that that stuff was, has been accepted is that it was meant for me uh, hasn't made my job any easier. All right? You know, the best thing I can say about it is there's times when I have one to give up that I looked at that and said, no, this is God's plan. And so I've stuck. Right? And so that's the only benefit that I had to it. Any, everything else, it, you know, it's a hard thing when you look at it and say, okay, this is the way it's supposed to be. And you realize you're actually supposed to measure up to that. And in the beginning, you try to measure up. And then you realize, you know what? Uh, if this is God's word, he's going to make me measure up. He's going to put in me what I need to measure up. I don't have to try to measure up myself. All I have to do is be who he called me to be. And if I do that, he'll make the rest come to pass. And we've never tried to make anything happen. And yet everything happens like clockwork. It's been amazing. And so that's one of the problems now that we have with people is everybody wants position. And everybody's vying for position. And everybody's, you know, well, what's in it for me? You know, what, what's the best position for me? Well, the best position for you is to humble yourself, serve God, serve the kingdom, get your mind off of you, and quit trying to be somebody. That's the best position for you. Amen? Quit trying to be somebody that everybody's going to look up to. If you try to make sure that you walk where God wants you, then God will make sure that the people that he needs to look up to you, they will do it. Why? Because God needs examples. The church needs examples, right? There's a lot of things I don't want to do. And, and I, I'll tell you from there, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And God says, but I need you to walk that as an example. And I'm like, I'll do it, but I don't want to. You know, why? Because the church needs examples. There's times when I've stepped out and done things. I don't want to do it. Why? I'm a, I'm a very private person. I like quiet. I like peace. I like to sit and read. Uh, I'm a private person, Right? But God needed people that would step out, speak up, and do the things. And so we did. And then we started training people how to do it. And that's what has caused a lot of the movement that has happened now. Why? Not because I wanted to do it. It wasn't in my nature to do it, in, in the sense of my own mentality or how I think about things. Right? But it is in my nature to be obedient. And so I will be obedient to my king. And that means do whatever I have to do, even if I don't like doing it. Amen? And the amazing thing is, once you do it enough, you actually start to like it. <laughs> so...
It's the way it works. There's some benefits to it, right? So, but that's one of the biggest things that I see, is I see everybody vying for position. Everybody's trying to get a title. They're trying to be something or do something. It's like, I mean, just live life. Live life, bless people, love God, love people, do to others as you would have done to you. Come on, this is a good life. It's a hard life because if you get into a position that God has not ordained for you, you're going to have a hard life. Why? Right? Because you're always going to be... See, if you get into a position God hadn't put you in, you're always going to have to maintain that position yourself against other people that want that position. Right? And you've also got to know that if you're in a position that God didn't want you there, there is a person that God wants there. And you're probably fighting against that, which means you're fighting against God. I mean, just... Think through those, okay? And you start to realize, okay, so just be who God calls you to be. But, you know, most people would rather be a big fish in a little pond than to be a little fish in a big pond. Right? Me, I like a bigger pond. You know? I, I don't have to think about being the, 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 the guy, you know? That's not what Christianity is about. Amen. It's about letting Jesus be the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? And let's just live life. And that way, you, what? because what, if you don't, Listen, if you don't put yourself somewhere, you don't have to maintain it. And that's what most people end up doing, is they end up trying to maintain a position that they were never put in by God. So, all right, let's move on. So, <clears throat> this means that we must view things the way they would be viewed from God's kingdom. Now, let's talk about that. Let's look at this situation. First off, it is the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Isn't that true? Isn't that what he said? So if it's his pleasure to give you the kingdom, then you, the, you don't have to struggle to get the kingdom. You hear that? You have to learn how to receive. That's, that's the big key, right? Now, we know that this, number one, it's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Number two, where is the kingdom? The kingdom of God is within you. Isn't that right? So if the kingdom is within you, I mean, think about this. You know, one of the things that I really enjoy about my life is the fact that I can spend time meditating on these things, you know, and I'll be honest with you, it's not because, well, that's because of the position you're in and, you know, you make your living, you know, from the gospel and, and you can do that. You know, I, I, I work a job. Let me tell you, before I was doing this, I was working a secular job and I worked many jobs and I worked over time, and I had, I had a wife and four children, and so three at any given time, okay? And so we had to have finances. I had to work jobs. And when I worked jobs, I spent more time meditating the Word than I get to now. Think about that. Now I have to make it happen. Why? Because I'm pulled on all the time. Everybody's got my phone number, and it rings constantly. And it's over everything you can imagine. It is constant. And so if I want time with God, I have to lay my phone down and walk off and tell somebody, if my phone rings, check it. If it's a prayer request, come get me. If it's anything else, it can wait. And I had to learn to do that because it wasn't, it wasn't easy. And so, but in the beginning, whatever, for, for the years, so all those years, when I was working a secular job, if you want to call it that, anything you do becomes spiritual. Right? We talked about that just the other day. Whatever you do becomes spiritual. So even if you work in what's called a secular job, it may be secular for some people, it's not for you. It's an act of worship for you on how well you do it because you're going to do it as unto the Lord, not as unto men. That's what the Bible says. And if you just, well, I'm doing a secular job and I'm just working here you know, to draw a paycheck and I want to go home and study the Bible, you're wasting your time studying the Bible. Why? Because you do your secular job as unto the Lord. And when you do, God blesses you, right? He'll, he'll do whatever he can do to either, you know, move you into where you need to be. But that's what the Bible says. That's not, maybe not be the way you feel, but it's what the Bible says. So whatever you do, whatever you put your hand to can prosper. Whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord, right? Not unto men. So when I was <clears throat> working jobs, yeah, secular jobs, as I would say, 
That's whenever I got most of my study done. That's whenever I, that's when I went in and started studying the Greek and the Hebrew words and what it meant and all these things. I started reading and meditating and confessing and saying all this stuff. And that's what I did constantly. And any spare minute I had, that's what I did. And if I had to go do something else, then I confessed the word of God while I was doing the other thing. That's how I lived, right? And now if I want to do that, now it's, you know, even harder than back then. And so why? Because now it's, See, used to it was a job pulling on me. Now it's people. And that, that's, it's, it's easy to kind of push a job off, right? It's much harder uh, to look at a person and go, okay, hang on, I need to go do this. Right? But you have to find time to spend with God, to walk with God. You can walk with God with people, as we said before. But there's times when you need to just pull aside and say, I got to spend time with God. Amen? Why? Because you'll hear all kinds of stuff. And believe it or not, God's got stuff he wants to tell you. And he wants to spend time with you. So we have to make sure that the way we look at things are the way that they would be viewed from God's kingdom. Now, um, yeah, one of it. Now, we're talking about number one, it's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. And number two, the kingdom is within you. Okay. Now, thinking of this all the time, people say, how, do, how would I do that all the time? Well, the Bible says we are to pray without ceasing. So that's all the time. Right. Now, how do you pray without ceasing? Without it, because you can only beg for stuff for so long. You understand what I'm saying? So obviously that's not the prayer that without ceasing that God's talking about. When he says, you know, he's not saying just come and ask for stuff. He's saying it's communion. It is fellowship with him. It's spending time with him, walking with him. Okay. Now, what is, what should our, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. What is the prayer we're told to pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, those are all, those are statements. They're commands. Thy kingdom come. It's not a begging. You're not saying, oh God, please let your kingdom come. He didn't say that. He said, this is how you pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, use your authority, use that dominion, speak and command his kingdom to be done. Right? And command his will to be done. Command his kingdom to come wherever you are. Why? Because the kingdom is within you. It's, his father, it's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. So wherever you go, the kingdom is there. Wherever you go, that's where his kingdom has come, and that's where his will is done. Where his will is done, that's where the kingdom is. So anywhere you go, you understand, you can take the kingdom anywhere you go, and if you just go and you don't do what the kingdom would do, then even though the kingdom is in you, the kingdom hasn't come to that place, that situation. You understand that? Yeah. So... The, when he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, your kingdom come, right? When he says that, he said, listen, the kingdom of God is within you. So wherever you go, the kingdom goes. But just because the kingdom goes, has the kingdom come to those people? Has the kingdom come to that situation? Why? We say, well, what would that look like? What Jesus said, go in and heal the people and say, the kingdom has come near to you. Why? Yeah, he did. He walked up to them, right? The kingdom is within you. The kingdom is not something that's going to come. The kingdom is within you. You get that? I'm not, I'm not saying there's not a future kingdom. I'm not saying there's not a time when all this gets wrapped up and Jesus is totally in control. I'm not saying that. I'm not talking about end time stuff per se. I'm talking about where you are right now. I'm, t I'm saying that you have the kingdom of God in you right now. Wherever you go, you take the kingdom there. And that, but even though you take the kingdom there, if you took, um, you take a policeman, the policeman embodies the authority of that city or nation or whatever it is that he represents. But if he walks up and sees this drug dealer selling drugs right there and he's just watching him, what well, is the authority? Has that, has that kingdom of that city come to that? Well, he took it there, but, it, but it's the, the will of the city is not being done because he's not doing anything about that drug deal. You see what I'm saying? So just because the authority is there doesn't mean anything's being done with it. So for us, when he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, the two have to be together. The kingdom has to come. Wherever we go, the kingdom is but then thy will must be done. Do you get that? That's, now when you do that, guess what you're going to be doing? Exercising dominion. You're going to start saying, no, it'll be this way and not that way. Right? So, now, um, well, and it goes back to Luke 9, 2 again. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What was he doing? Take the kingdom to them, say the kingdom has come nigh, and then demonstrate the kingdom. Do the will of God. Take the kingdom your kingdom come, your will be done. Take them the kingdom, preach the kingdom, do the will. You got that? It's not enough just for you to show up. So, now, go with me to 
page 5. We have to think in terms of, does the way I am viewing this or thinking about this line up with how this would be viewed from a kingdom perspective? It's kind of the same thing we've been talking about. In other words, does the way I'm viewing this line up with the command, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? See, that's how we have to think. If we're going to exercise dominion, if you're going to live a life of dominion, notice I'm not, when we say exercise dominion, that's one thing. Okay? People can exercise dominion and yet not have a life of dominion. What I'm talking about and really what today, what I really want to just emphasize to you and get across to you is there has to be a point where we start to live the life of dominion. Now, as you live a life of dominion, you're going to come into conflict with people around you that don't live a life of dominion, right? That was one of the big, uh, big things that the Word of Faith camp got blasted with all the time. You know, well, you, you think you can just say this or say that and it's going to happen and you know, you, you're, you're removing the sovereignty of God. No, we're enforcing the sovereignty of God because we're agreeing with what God said about the situation. Yeah. Yeah? There's a big difference in that. Well, and the bad part is they'll start to say, well, who do you think you are? Well, you know what? It does matter who I think I am, but it matters more who God thinks I am. And re- the key is that I think who I am according to what, who God thinks I am. Right? Now, religious people are going to give you flack over that. Why? Because religion always wants to keep you down and tries to make you think that you're worthless. Right? If you were worthless, when you say you're worthless, you're saying Jesus meant nothing. Why? Because God paid Jesus for you. Right? And if you were worthless, Guess what? He wouldn't have paid the most priceless thing that he had for you if you were worthless. The fact that he paid Jesus for you should give you an idea of his estimation of you in his mind. Amen? Man was God's highest creation, right? Not his lowest. Now, so let me give you a couple here real quick. Well, we'll go on to that. Uh, Now, Another aspect. These are, this is all talking about how you line up with things uh, in your mind, how you think about things and how you view things, view things. Does the way I'm viewing this line up with the principles of the kingdom parables? So you can start to, again, go, get a hold of uh, either the book we did on Behold the Kingdom. We talk about the kingdom parables in there, but you can, you can just look them up in your Bible. And he, he kept saying, uh, he gave this parable of the kingdom. And it says the kingdom of God is like this or the kingdom of heaven is like that. Look at those principles. Look at what they say. And, and don't just read the, the nice story. Find out what he was talking about. Find out what is the purpose of this parable. What was he trying to get? Because every parable had to do with an attitude. And then, of course, you can look in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and even talk there about Beatitudes. Beatitudes, good way to remember it. The be attitudes, or the attitude to be, right? And so when you realize that, you start to realize what the, how the, we're supposed to live in this kingdom. Well, as kings and priests in this kingdom, kings have dominion in it. They have authority. So we are to exercise the dominion and authority as kings and reign in life as kings. Okay, Romans tells us. And as we do that, we're going to exercise authority. We're going to exercise dominion. Why? Because we're going to start looking more and more like Jesus. You realize Jesus' whole life, even though he was humble and meek and everything that they, they said about him, even in the midst of all that, he totally, constantly exercised dominion over everything. When there wasn't enough food, he didn't say, well, go out around the, the area and see what you can scrounge up. No, he said, no, bring it to me. And he took it and he blessed it and then he broke it and it was multiplied and it not only fed him, but there were lots left over. Amen? You notice, they, he didn't automatically start thinking, well, you know, how's this going to work? Or, I don't know where we're going to get more bread. For. They, they didn't do that. Why? He understood it was the Father's pleasure to give him the kingdom. What's the kingdom? In the kingdom, everybody's fed. Amen? Amen? Yes, amen. I mean, think about it. Think of, you take a seed, and you take that seed and you put it in the ground. What comes out of it? Let's say a seed of wheat, a grain of wheat. What does it do? It produces lots of wheat. Well, isn't that what Jesus did with a piece of bread? He just had it, it, it was doing its natural thing. It just did it a lot faster. Isn't that right? He didn't do anything abnormal. He just let that wheat multiply itself 
just like it was supposed to do as a seed. Right? Why? Because he didn't have the limitations of thinking that's not how it works. Well, it only works that way on earth. But in the kingdom, it doesn't work that way. In the kingdom, everybody gets fed. Amen? Amen? And, and in the kingdom, everything is, there is sowing and reaping. And all they did was they, they just sowed the bread first and then they reaped. Right? It was the same principle. So what I want you to do today, I want you to realize the dominion, the position that God has put you in, in a position of dominion, that you are to exercise that, that dominion and walk it out in every area of your life. Once you understand that, you'll have dominion over your finances, which means you'll always have what you need to get done, what you need to get done. Amen? Amen? And the more you put that toward the kingdom, guess what? The more you'll have available. So, and it's the same thing in relationships. Whenever you think in terms of relationships through the principles of the kingdom, then guess what? When you start living out the principles of the kingdom, uh, you're not going to have a problem finding friends. Why? Because the principles of the kingdom are if somebody needs something, you give it to them. Right? And you help and you bless. And when you do that, guess what? People like you. Right? Why? Because you're thinking you're doing unto them what you would have done to you. And, and you know, we always talk about that as a principle back to me. You know, I'm doing to them what I would have done unto me. Okay, that's true. But you realize when you're doing that, you're doing that to somebody. And whenever they see that, then guess what? They're going to glorify God in you by the fact that you're living that life. Do you see that? I'm talking about a life of absolute freedom, total freedom. You don't have to worry about anything. Why? Because what good does it do to worry about it? What, are you going to add one cubit to your stature? Are you going to change anything? No, you're not. You know, are, are you going to do is just cause more problems, right? Like Dr. Summerall said the other day when we watched that video, you start worrying, it's foolish. Why? Because when you, when you finish, you got just as much as you started with. Same, same worry, same thing, right? You just, the only thing that gets multiplied is more worries, right? So, <clears throat> now, notice here. Uh, yeah, is my attitude or actions lining up with the kingdom principles in the kingdom parables? Now look at point D. Everything must be viewed through the filter of being sons of God. So what have we talked about so far? You have to view everything through the filter of a new creation. You have to view everything through the filter of the kingdom. And you have to view everything through the filter of being a son of God. When you start viewing everything through those filters, everything changes. Now listen, if you want just churchianity, where you have, you know, church as usual, then we're not talking about what the Bible talks about. When, you, when we talk about these things, the new creation, the kingdom, and being sons of God, that's not the way the church thinks. See? Most churches are run on business principles, mm -hmm. right? Earthly business, not kingdom business, right? And, well, yeah, it's one of the things, uh, I, again, I know I mentioned Dr. Summer a lot. We've been, I've been, uh, going back and revisiting some of the things, uh, both the videos that I have of him, but also a lot of memories that I have of him when I was there. And see, people don't like it. Uh, the people want to blast people, but I will tell you this. Dr. Summerall told me to my face. Well, he told me, uh, I wasn't the only one there. There was about six or ten of us there. But I was in the group that he, that he spoke to, okay? And he's, he, one time he said, you know these people? They blast Kenneth Copeland. And he said, Here's what they don't know. Kenneth Copeland is the most generous man I've ever met. They said they want to blast him because of what he has. And he said he gives away everything. He said he gives away these airplanes. And he said before he does, he'll have them, the, the, have them uh, tuned up. It'll be $50,000 an engine just to get them tuned up. And he's going to give it away, but he'll pay $50,000 an engine just to get it tuned up. So when he gives it away, it's in the best possible shape. He didn't just give him a piece of junk. He said he has all new tires on it. He'll fill it up with fuel, thousands and thousands of dollars, and then he'll give that airplane to a minister. He said he's the most generous man I've ever met. And he said, and everybody wants to blast him. He said, and he keeps giving, and God keeps giving back. He said, where's the cap on that? At what point do you tell God, God, I don't want any more blessing. I can't take it anymore, so don't give me any more blessing. He said he keeps giving, God keeps giving. He said, and he said, and the same people that blast him, he said, all he did was buy the best house he could afford. He said, and which is what everybody else does. He said, the fact is, they just don't have the money he has because God has blessed him. And he said, and they want to blast him because they don't have 
what he has. And I never forget when he said it because it made a, because I, you know, I was a big on Keith Green, which meant basically hippie lifestyle and, you know, nothing. You have nothing. You should have nothing, you know. And, and, I, and again, I'm not saying that, that, that there, there isn't uh, excess, okay? But, but the key is, at what point, where do you decide? No, I should say, who are you to decide where somebody else's cap is? As long as, what, as long as they're getting it by giving. Amen? Amen? See, people say, well, I don't like this. Well, you know what? Then tell them or shut up. Yeah. Right? Because if you're not telling them, you're just gossiping. Amen? And at some point, you know, people ask me, what do you think of this person? I told him one time, he's not my servant. Amen. He's not my servant. You know, you want to talk to, if he says he's God's servant, go talk to God about it. Don't talk to me about him. Why? I got nothing to do. I don't, what he does or doesn't do is not going to affect me one bit. Ain't going to affect you one bit. Why are you talking about him? Right? Spend your, see, little people spend their time talking about people. Right? Medium people spend their time talking about things. Big people spend their time talking about ideas. Where can we go? What can we do to advance the kingdom? I, I, I won't waste my time talking about stuff, things, people. I'm not going to waste my time. Why? Because I'd rather think about the kingdom. I'd rather think about what is God doing? What does he want done on this earth? And what anybody else does, that's neither here nor there to me. I could care less. You know? If they disqualify themselves, it just means I get pushed further up in the race. Yay. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> now, I don't want them disqualified. But I'm just saying, it's none of my business. My business is what, am I doing what God has called me to do? That's all that counts. Right? So, now, here... The next one is the filter of being sons of God. Finally, we must make sure that our attitudes, actions, and viewpoints line up with how they should be in a son or daughter of God. Now, first off, let's get some scriptures. Uh, 1 John 3, 1, everybody knows this. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now, notice, I'll give you several scriptures here, but if we're going to view this through the filter of being a son, then we got to know we are a son. Right? And then 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And he goes on to saying, it does not, does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Why? Because we shall see him as he is. So what we do know is this. If people say, what's it going to be like over there? Don't know. I'm not there yet. So it really doesn't matter. What counts is now are we the sons of God. So am I living and thinking as a son of God now? If you live and think as a son or daughter of God, as we'd say, then guess what? You're going to be seeing things through the filter of being a son. You're going to think like a son. And, if, and if, see, when you think like a son, everything changes. Because whenever you think like, like a son of God, you know that your heavenly father is your father. You know it's his pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know that he's not going to let you go without you know that he's going to take care of you no matter where you are. And so you have no problem helping other people, feeding other people, clothing other people. You, you, you have no problem with that. Why? Because you know you're not going to go without. So the world thinks, well, if I give this away, then I've got to work to get it back or something else. And, and that's not the way the kingdom thinks. The kingdom thinks, you need something? Here it is. Why? Well, my heavenly father gave me that. He'll give me more. Amen? Amen? And so there's a whole different, I'm talking about a, a completely different lifestyle, a completely different mindset, uh, a, a completely different uh, Christianity, if you want to call it that. It's, not, it's only different from the way we see it today. It is the Christianity of the Bible. It's the only way to live. We'll, we'll talk about that today too, I believe. I'll give you a couple more. Romans eight fourteen. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So he's talking about people that were alive right then, people that are alive today. If you're being led by the Spirit of God, you're a son of God. Right? Romans 8, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. God, the whole earth is waiting for us to grow up and think and act like sons. Galatians 4, 6, because you are, not shall be, because you are a son, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Philippians 2, 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of crooked 
and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights. Hear that? That's what a son of God does. A son of God shines as a light. A son of, listen, you weren't made a son of God just so you could live a good life. You weren't given the kingdom just so you can have a kingdom. You were given the kingdom as a son so you can shine as lights in a dark and perverse world so that the world can look at you and say, man, I want to live like that. Amen? I mean, you look at that. You know, regardless of what you have or don't have, and all, I'm not even talking about that. I'm just saying, no matter what's going on, everybody's worried about this or worried about that. And they go, why don't you ever worry? You know, why should I worry? You know? Uh, is, is it going to help? You know, it's not going to help. So why should you worry? Right? Why? My Heavenly Father is going to take care of me. No matter what happens, I'm going to be taken care of. I don't care what the economy does. Guess what? I'm going to survive. Survive and thrive. That's what I'll do. Why? Because He promised that to me. It's His pleasure to give me the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within me, so it's within me. So guess what? In the kingdom, everybody eats. In the kingdom, everybody has what they need. Hallelujah. Amen? So, see, if you gather it all up here and then you just, see, like I me, mean, I go to Africa, I go to Australia, I go to these places, and I got choices. <clears throat> when I'm going to go over there for a month, uh, you know, a month at a time, you have, to, you have to take clothing with you. And I'm going to go over there and I'm end up being on satellite television, be all over the world on television. And it's going to be recorded. Everything you do is recorded. Every move you make, every word you say, you know, every, every piece of clothing you wear, it's all recorded forever. Right? It'll never disappear. And going for a month, you, generally I cannot take enough clothes for what I would need for a month it, because we're only allowed like two suitcases, right? And you can't pack enough for, to, to be on television every day, wear different clothes every day. And so there come a point where I said, you know what? Uh, here's what I do know. And people, people say these kind of things. Uh, and I'll, I'll take it in two ways real quick. They'll say... Um, uh, well, God wants me to go to this country as a missionary. I just don't, I don't know. You know, I just, I, I don't know if I can do that. And so why not? Well, you know, I, what, 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 what will we eat? You know, they eat different. I said, well, you know what? Guess what? No matter where you go, if you're going there to preach the gospel, it means there's people there. If there's people there, they're eating. <laughs> How about that? You know, they're actually eating there, right? Uh, more than likely, they've got clothes there. More than likely. Right. And if they don't, then it's just less you have to pack. So anyway, so, no. <laughs> okay. but just think about it. I mean, where have you see people worry about this stuff? You know, I, I'm a I'm a picky eater. Right. Actually, my wife says I'm a picky. eater. Right? I'm actually not a picky eater. I'm actually a simple eater. Right. There's a difference. Right. Uh, but, you know, my, it's, the way I eat should be easy anywhere. You know, I mean, there are there is chicken on every continent. So I can survive no matter where I go. Amen? I mean, and, and, and sometimes the chicken is good, like, like at Nando's. When you go to Nando's, that's good chicken. Sooner or later, we'll get it here in the States. But if you go with me overseas, be ready to eat Nando's every day. We will eat there every day if I can, because <laughs> it's good. So, but you can survive, right? And what, what counts most? What you're going to eat or, how, or whether the people get the kingdom, whether you bring the kingdom to them. Amen? But I know no matter what I take with me, and that's what I've, I've finally got my wife to thinking along the same line. She's, we'll start to go somewhere and she'll say, did I get everything? I'm like, you know what? Guess what? If we get there and you don't have it, I'll buy it for you. How about that? Right? And that takes all the pressure off. Right? And then sometimes she says, you know what? I left this at home. And I left that at home. And I left this. <laughs> okay. So now, now you're like my kids. You're starting to leave your wallet. Where's your wallet? Oh, Dad, can you buy lunch? Well, I left my wallet over here. Yeah, okay. I got it. Okay. No, it's seriously. But, but we just have to realize, just why would we worry about this stuff? I know that no matter where I go, if I don't have what I need, God will bring it. Somehow, I will have what I need. I'm never going to go without. Why? In the sense of something I need. Why? Because I have a good Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen? It's just that simple. So, all right. Uh, I'm going to send you to break. Yes, go to break quickly. Sorry.